In cycling, there's a component of competition between the athletes. And there's the road in front of you, to be devoured pedal after pedal. But there's also a challenge within oneself, the limit to be overcome by fighting your fatigue until you reach the end, sometimes. This is the case for all athletes who ride a two-wheeler. After all, you lose when you give in and can't take it anymore. In the history of Italian cycling, there's a particular rider who experienced all of this decades ago and won many times. Unlike the others, however, his limit was not defined by fatigue. He had a heart condition, which sometimes forced him to stop, even in the middle of a race. The fans would name him Crazy Heart. He was very popular, loved by the public, and his was an exemplary career, made up of unforgettable days. One of these saw him climb up to 1,880 meters, up to a refuge with an important name, Rifugio Sapienza, climbing the slopes of a particular mountain, Etna. Huge and majestic, with an incandescent heart, difficult to predict and potentially dangerous. Just like him, Franco Bitossi. The crazy heart that wrote an unforgettable page in the history of the Giro on May 26th, 1967, on the volcano. The mountain has a simple rule. If you want to go further, you can't go around it. You have to get to the top. This is in Cima. The greatest Giro d'Italia climbs. Produced by Dagger in association with Agenzia Ice for an appreciation of the best that Made in Italy has to offer. Episode 1, Etna, the crazy heart that conquered the volcano. Nineteen sixty seven was a different time. These were the years of the economic boom of television, when foreign athletes arrived on Italian roads to compete and even win the pink jersey. The season of Coppi and Bartoli was over, and fans were looking for other heroes to root for, to get passionate about. Journalists were likewise looking for them to fill the space left empty by the eternal rivals who'd amazed the whole country after the war. But 1967 was also a season of political unrest. In fact, the Giro of that year immediately had to face the first unexpected event, which had nothing to do with the sport itself. Hundreds of pacifists and protesters sat in the street to demonstrate against the war in Vietnam, making it impossible for the race to start. They tried to change their minds to explain to them that cycling is something different, but it wouldn't work. Torriani, the beating heart and brains behind the complex organization of the Giro, had no choice but to leave Milan, to move the start of the first stage to Treviglio, and to take note of the fact that the Giro had also become a media event, a perfect stage to address the world. Thus, the 15th Giro set off, descending south to Naples, and then by ship to Palermo, where they would run the first day not far from the capital, and then to reach it, the volcano. There was still a long way to go. They were only in the seventh stage, but it was already known who the big names of the season would be. Gimondi, Anquetil, Altig, Motta, Van Louis, Adorni, and then that one Belgian with an unpronounceable name, Eddie Merckx, a very young champion who turned pro just two years earlier, racing for the first time in Italy. They were the foreigners who arrived at the Giro, while our riders still remained mainly within our borders where other prestigious races abounded. Among the Italians, there was a Tuscan from Carmignano, who was very much loved by the public, capable of becoming the protagonist of great moments. He did it previously on the five ascents of the Cuneo Pinadolo. 
where Copy had given a show in 49 on Sestrier and Izoar. He was fast and approached the climbs with a shrewdness that still fascinates. He attacked in the most demanding sections, as if he were driven forward by the love of a challenge, always ready to challenge himself, to attempt an escape. He was one of those cyclists who run more on instinct than by strategy. It was Franco Bitossi. May 26, 1967. For the first time, the Giro passed on the slopes of Etna. In each new edition, the Giro looked for new itineraries capable of putting on a show. It's a sport that's played on the streets, close to the people, and it rightly passes through the most representative and fascinating places of the boot. So here we were, at that goal set at Rifugio Sapienza, with 1,880 meters to climb after the departure from Catania and a first section in the plains, among vast expanses of orange groves, which literally goes around the volcano, on its slopes, and up it. In June, in Sicily, the sun beat down. The athletes were also tired from the journey they faced to get to Sicily. As mentioned before, it was a different time, in which travel was more complicated and consequently more demanding than it is today. Some moved from stage to stage by car. Others traveled by train. During the morning, the temperatures rose, which meant that some runners suffered from thirst and stopped to drink by drawing water from the cisterns in the fields. They would pass through Paterno, Bronte, Randazzo, and then return to the coast, crossing Arcireale before heading inland towards Nicolosi. And there, the athletes were faced with 19 kilometers of ascent, an average gradient of 6.3%, and a difference in height of 1,163 meters. There, on the seventh day, the show was expected to begin, in an environment that was already a show in itself. A bare landscape welcomed the men, with terraces and dark walls, a few abandoned cottages and many prickly pears. The terrain alternated between lava soil and colorful patches of vegetation, even if those who followed the race from home couldn't notice it because the shots were strictly in black and white. Many spectators climbed up there between lava flows covered by the road to watch the Giro go by. Some had prepared signs to encourage the racers, writing names that have now entered legend. Gimondi, Motta. Many of those people were seeing the ride for the first time after hearing about it on the radio. Etna does not disappoint. In fact, from Nicolosi forward, the real emotional part of the race starts. After a day fought by a group that seems equally fierce and determined, a handful of racers discovered they still had something in them, and they went for it. The competition came alive. First is Gimondi, who distanced the others, then Motta, Gonzalez, and Adorni. But as often happens in cycling, nothing is set in stone until the end. A few kilometers from the end, it happened. The Spaniard Aurelio Gonzalez set the tone, moving forward together with Schiavon, Carletto, and Bitossi. Gimondi stayed behind, even though he was certainly among the favorites in that edition. Born in Valbrembana, where there's no shortage of climbs, he grew up riding the bike he used to deliver the mail instead of having his mother work, and would become a precocious talent. It's said of Gimondi that he did the best possible in an era dominated by Eddie Merckx, proving to be a great champion while being the eternal second to that cannibal who left nothing to anyone. The rider from Bergamo would stand out in other stages of that 15th Giro, but not on Etna, where the heat and fatigue suddenly seemed to take their toll, so much so as to prevent him from chasing the fleeing group, firmly led by the Spaniard. 300 meters from the finish, Gonzalez went for it. He sprinted to leave the others behind, and that's when it happened. Bitossi got up on the pedals, pushed, and followed, 
and 100 meters later, he surpassed him, crossing the finish line first, beating the Spaniard climber and all the others. Schiavon ended third, Carletto ended fourth. Motta and Merckx were also left behind. Anquetil would run over a stray before the finish line, which unfortunately ended up in the middle of the road. Crazy Hart showed one of his exploits that day, and certainly amazed his opponents, because there was a moment in the race in which, so they say, he seemed to have stopped. Hard to say if it really happened. If it did, Bitossi still got back in his saddle, continuing to compete to win, in an addition in which many, however, made the diametrically opposite strategic choice. In 1967, in fact, we saw the exceptional reintroduction of a particular prize given to the last in the standings, a recognition designed for those who, despite everything, pedal to the end, demonstrating tenacity and perseverance, so much so as to deserve a podium of their own. The black jersey had been awarded for the first time in 1946, the year the Giro resumed after the war. I was inspired by a uniform that had nothing to do with cycling. It was in fact the one worn by Giuseppe Ticozzelli in the 1926 tour. Ticozzelli rode as an independent, without a team. He'd got on his bike with the black Casale jersey, the football team he played for. He was a particular person with a very personal point of view on the race. He ran, but then he stopped for lunch in the taverns along the road. Because, competing alone, he couldn't count on anyone's support, not even for supplies. 20 years after Ticozzelli, the latest arrival would start being awarded like this, with the shirt inspired by his. The black jersey became extraordinarily sought after, also due to the prize money that was awarded to it. And by conquering it, one was guaranteed fame and celebrity. Luigi Malabrocca and Sante Carollo were well-known names for this at the time. Malabrocca in particular became a legend of his time, also because of the stratagems he devised to waste time, from stopping in bars to repairing his bicycle. He was a friend of Coppi, and also very capable of going fast, perhaps not to win, however, against the undisputed champions of his time. So he gave a show like this, instead going for the bottom of the standings. It's also thanks to characters like him that the black race became so sought after as to generate behaviors that were not entirely sportsmanlike. Some even went into hiding to make others go ahead and fall behind and convinced the organizers in 1952 to eliminate it from the regulation. In 1967, it was awarded again, exceptionally. These were riders who aimed for last place, which, for the record, was assigned to Lucillo Lievore. But Crazy Heart was undoubtedly the kind of man who aimed forward, never backwards. Even after an unexpected break, In previous seasons, Bitossi had demonstrated what he could do. Yet it just so happened that he had to take his feet off the pedals and break, and put his hand to his chest, sitting down to catch his breath. You can blame sudden tachycardia, which forced him to give his heart time to resume its regular beat, while his opponents flew away. His legs swelled, his pulse increased alarmingly, and he could only find a way to get to the bottom among the last. His career was conditioned by this disabling disorder, especially at its onset. It happened unpredictably and uncontrollably and marked the end of the race. Fiorenzo Magni's Filco team knew he could win, but also just stop. But that was okay, because his good days could really be good. However, Bitossi's illness remained penalizing, and in the first years of competition, it had slowed him down, 
even leading him to consider retiring. Cycling is a tough life for anyone whose heart can keep up with the pace of the climb, let alone others. Then came the discovery capable of changing the fate of the Tuscan. In the stage races, after the first few days, his heart returned to beat with him and not against him. Then he could make a difference. It was just a matter of holding on and having faith in one's chances of a comeback. For this reason, one-day competitions were not the ones in which he gave his best, especially at the beginning. However, he sought solutions to the problem, obtaining a significant improvement in his health. The last case of tachycardia was the Giro di Toscana in 1968. Luckily, just before the descent, which gave him time to recover without having to stop and thus compromising the result. And that's it. Those crises passed, at least during the race, and he was able to embark on an important career, precisely as a climber. Yes, it's on the climbs that a crazy heart gives its best. Even at Philotex, where he arrives in 1966, they knew that the unknown factor of tachycardia remained, but everyone believed in him and he would not disappoint, heart permitting. That nickname stuck, and to this day, Franco Bitossi is crazy heart for everyone. Just like Little Tony sang in 1967 at the San Remo Festival. Bitossi admitted that his heart condition continued to throw a tantrum at times, but no longer during the race. The perception of his own fragility, of how volatile results can be, may have stuck with him. Perhaps that was why he faced the climbs with that spirit. He could reach the bottom, or be forced to stop. Whatever it was, he would try. Over the years, he became an athlete capable of winning, but also of finishing second. Someone who knew how to help his teammates on days when he realized he wasn't the one with legs strong enough to get to first place. And perhaps this also contributed to his popularity. Years later, to those who asked him about those moments when he took his hands off the handlebars to bring them to his chest, he replied that it was a pose for photographers. The illness was there, it was real, but it rarely happened with a lens nearby ready to shoot it. However, those images were emblematic for telling the story of an athlete who, before facing the toughest climbs, had to come to terms with himself. A perfect representation of the challenge faced by those who run races such as the Giro. That of Crazy Heart is the story of another era, of cycling in the 60s, that began with the centenary edition, the stages that would become legendary the big headlines of the newspapers. Today, more than ever, the story of the climber with a weak heart is fascinating. Because in modern cycling, an athlete with problems like his could hardly compete. His career would be stopped before competing in a Giro by the strict health checks to which those aiming for competition are subjected. Yet not only did Bitossi win, but his was also an extraordinarily long career, which began in 1961 and ended in 1978. He competed up to the age of 38 and won about 172 races, 21 stages in the Giro d'Italia, competed with athletes of the caliber of Merckx, Gimondi, and De Vlemink. Perhaps the heart gave him problems, but character and willpower were all there, as demonstrated on that day at the end of May on Etna. There, on the Sicilian peak, there have been some strange days over the years. Many years after Crazy Heart crossed the finish line first, the world looked to Vincenzo Nibali, who on his mountain, many thought would win. He lost an opportunity in 2011, when Rifugio Sapienza was reached by a new road, on which, however, the shark would not dominate. He had to settle, so to speak, for the fourth place and Nibali would have to wait until 2017 to try again. 
It was 2017. He came to that edition of the Giro as a great protagonist. Winner of the previous edition, but the Slovenian Jan Polantz took off in front of the volcano with a 178 kilometer break that ended there at Sapienza, leaving the greats of that year behind. The shark came 10th in good company among those who failed to answer Polantz. There was also Tom Dumoulin. Years later, it was the 2020 edition, that of the pandemic, with the arrival in Piano Proversana and a seventh place for the rider from Messina. Two years later, in 2022, a fourth place. For Nibali, it's the end of a history of stages run well, but without ever getting the satisfaction of a victory at home, which is also an important and meaningful result for an athlete at the end of his career, who'd been struggling for a few years. When he announced his retirement at the end of the season in May 2022, publicly saying that this would be his last Giro, they asked him, if things had gone better on Etna, would anything have changed? Nibali was quick to reply that the day of his retirement had already been decided. And so Etna is the mountain that has crowned a crazy heart among the greats and that has disappointed others, as basically happens in all unforgettable mountain climbs. Perhaps Franco Bitossi had just understood it more clearly due to his heart problems, that this is cycling in general. You can ride to win, but then you can find yourself stationary anyway. At least until the next race. In Cima, the greatest Giro d'Italia climbs, is a Giro d'Italia podcast produced by Doug Ear, starring Daniel Tanner, executive producer Marta Donà and Carlo Lenotti. Written by Valentina Camerini, with the editorial support of Giacomo Botto. Directed by Marco Ferrarini. Producer, Irene Oriani. Sound design and original music by Pasquale Lo Savio. Recording, Dario Cuomo. Artwork, Andrea Lodetti. English adaptation, Diego Ferrarini. Special thanks to Silvia Forestieri, Eva Vicentin, and Simone Pozzi. Una produzione Doggear.